from News Channel 8, this is News Talk with Bruce DePoint. Great to have you with us on this Back to Work Tuesday. Hi, everybody. Thanks for your time this time. One Bush brother coming to the rescue of another in South Carolina Monday. Former President George W. making his first campaign appearance in 2016 in support of Jeb's run for the White House. Correspondent Gary Tuckman was there. Former President George W. Bush with his wife Laura on the 2016 campaign trail to try to make his brother Jeb the next president. I came here for two reasons. One, because I care deeply about Jeb. And two, because I care deeply about our country. The two sons of another former president, George H.W. Bush, have not campaigned together during this election until now in South Carolina. There seems to be a lot of name calling going on, but I want to remind you what our good dad told me one time. Labels are for soup cans. George W. Bush did not mention Donald Trump by name, but there were clear inferences to the real estate mogul. Now, I understand that Americans are angry and frustrated, but we do not need someone in the Oval Office who mirrors and inflames our anger and frustration. And those inferences were sprinkled throughout his speech. Strength is not empty rhetoric. It is not bluster. And in my experience, the strongest person usually isn't the loudest one in the room. Jeb Bush is significantly behind in the South Carolina primary polls, but hopes this event provides a spark. If Jeb Bush doesn't stun the political world and win the South Carolina primary, it will break the Bush family Palmetto State winning streak. His brother won here in 2000 and was uncontested in 2004. His father won in 1988 and 1992. It's Bush country, man. South Carolina is Bush country. Many supporters here believe George W. Bush's brotherly campaign appearance can help change the dynamics in the state's primary. I think he was a wonderful president. I know he gets a lot of criticism, um, but I think given the cards he was dealt that he did a wonderful job. So you think this will help his brother's campaign? Yes. You think he can win South Carolina? I think he can. I think if he doesn't win, he's going to do very well. While many of the people here have supported Jeb Bush from the beginning of the campaign, some others have gravitated towards him because of their dislike for one of the other Republican candidates. How does it make you feel when Donald Trump makes fun of Jeb by saying he's campaigning with his mommy and now his brother? Juvenile is really the only word to say it. Um, I think that's the only way to describe the way that he really is in general, is very juvenile, very childlike, and it's not really, I think, getting him anywhere with people who are really paying attention to things. But Donald Trump has a commanding lead in the polls, much to the dismay of many people here who have supported Bushes in the past and plan to support this Bush in the immediate future this Saturday. I ask for your support next Saturday. I ask for your prayers for our family. God bless you all. Thank you very much for coming. Gary Tuckman, CNN, North Charleston, South Carolina. Joining us now, Washington Post reporter Callum Borchers. He's covering the 2016 race for the White House, and he joins us from the Post's new newsroom downtown. It's great having you with us today, Callum. We appreciate very much your time. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Uh, talk about uh, George W. Bush's appearance in North Charleston, South Carolina, on behalf of his uh, brother, Jeb. From, ev from everything we read, George W. has been, been paying very close attention to the race and has been dying to get into the fray, though ahead of his remarks, we weren't sure how much he would take on Donald Trump uh, directly. Well, that's right, and we were waiting for this moment because the question from the outside of the campaign was sort of two-pronged, right? It was, would W get out on the campaign trail for Jeb, and would it be more of an asset or a liability? Uh, the timing here is important, and as you noted in your report from the field, South Carolina is a great place to roll him out. He's very popular down there. Uh, it is Bush country, as a lot of folks say down there. So this was a good time to bring him out. But you also saw Donald Trump, before W even got out on the trail, sort of heading things off. You saw it start in the debate on Saturday night and it's continued in the last couple of days with very strong critiques of the Bush legacy. He, uh, 43, never mentioning Donald Trump by name, but if, if you were even half paying attention to his speech, you got the references, you got the thrust of his remarks. He wasn't just pro-Jeb. He was making a, 
some broader points about who should serve in the Oval Office, about temperament and uh, disposition and, and uh, uh, background, uh, who, who has the life experience, the professional experience to make the tough decisions that come to a, a commander-in-chief, to a president, often sitting alone in the Oval Office. Uh, there was no mistaking the, the broad points that the former president was, was making on behalf of his brother and the GOP frontrunner. Yeah, the Trump references were unmistakable, and since they're in South Carolina, it was somewhat reminiscent of what South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley did in her response to the State of the Union last month. Remember, she said similar things. We don't need bluster. It's not all about talk. Uh, didn't mention Trump by name, but was clearly referring to him. Um, what George Bush is doing there is, is sort of echoing what we've heard from Jeb on, on the trail as well, and I think that what, uh, what Jeb Bush is hoping for is that it will carry a little bit more weight coming from somebody else, which is sort of embracing that cheerful tortoise uh, uh, you know, persona that, he, that he's taken on, where he's not the most blustery, uh, he's not the loudest person in the room, but that uh, what you need is actually someone who, as uh, George W. Bush just said, who doesn't necessarily mirror the anger in the electorate, but actually represents the cooler head prevailing. What does Jeb Bush need in South Carolina, at a minimum, to avoid uh, whispers that his campaign is going, that he is going to follow Chris Christie and Carly Fiorina and Rick Santorum and, and Jim Gilmore, all these others who've headed for the exits. What does he need? I, I, I would guess that a win is, is unlikely. That would really be uh, a shock. So in terms of a second, a strong third, maybe even fourth, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of eager to get your take. What does Jeb Bush need at a minimum to uh, build on momentum or create momentum? Sure. I mean, a win would obviously be great. I don't think that's probably realistic, as you said, and I'm not sure that it's necessary. I think what's probably a more attainable uh, goal for him is maybe like a strong third. Uh, you, I think you're looking for a performance that sort of follows on what you saw from Marco Rubio in Iowa and what you saw from John Kasich in New Hampshire, right? Because at the moment, we're still very much in that year of the outsider mode, where it's Cruz and Trump at the top, and beyond those two, there's sort of that fight for who's going to be the quote-unquote establishment front runner, right? And it looked like like Rubio coming out of Iowa. He stumbled in New Hampshire. Uh, John Kasich took that spot and finished second in the Granite State, but he doesn't look like maybe he can carry quite as well in other parts of the country. It's time if Jeb Bush is going to have a realistic shot at the nomination for him to sort of vault himself up and make a claim for, you know what, it's not necessarily Rubio, it's not Kasich. I'm going to be that guy who's the response to the outsider candidates in Trump and Cruz. Let's pivot for a moment and talk about the frontrunner Donald Trump and, and uh, Texas Senator Ted Cruz. It wasn't all that long ago and I believe it was at a Tea Party event here in, here in Washington where the two spoke in close proximity to one another and they were, I think, on the stage together uh, briefly for a time and that gave them a chance to sort of interact uh, in a public way. And uh, that had uh, political observers talking about a bromance. Well, that is all gone. Uh, Trump is now hammering Cruz and really even, uh, I, th I think one can say, threatening Cruz in a very uh, public and, and uh, belligerent sort of manner. He is, and I think the biggest change there, Bruce, is that Cruz is finally sort of engaging right back, right? I mean, we saw initially, uh, I think it was the, the maniac comment was sort of that first you know, hint of this breakup of the bromance, <laughs> as, as you and we've called it that as well. Um, and, and you saw, you know, Cruz come right back with this sort of goofy uh, Twitter message where he posted that maniac music video. He was trying to keep it lighthearted, take it in stride, and not really engage. In fact, he's criticized us in the media for trying to put him and Trump into a cage match, as he says. Well, it, he sure looks like he's walking right into that cage voluntarily at this moment. And, uh, and he is fighting back hard. You saw it in the debate. You saw him go hard after Trump. And you saw him making the argument that I I think we've heard from a lot of folks in the conservative side, at least a, a certain strain of the conservative media, which is that Donald Trump, for all the bluster and the rhetoric that might offend you, set that aside, he's not a reliable conservative on key issues for us. You saw it when they went uh, back and forth on Planned Parenthood during the debate. I think that's where Cruz is really starting to hit hard, and I think that's where the tenor of the race is dramatically changing from the all-friendly uh, affair that we had just a month ago. Can you, Callum, talk about the impact that we think immigration might play uh, as we draw closer to the South Carolina uh, primary? Uh, uh, Marco Rubio, uh, famously a member of the Gang of Eight, trying to cobble together some sort of uh, bipartisan immigration uh, reform package that never ended up, that, that did uh, notably make its way out of the Senate, but never got an up or down vote in the House. Uh, Rubio then pivoting and, and, and turning his back on the, on the uh, legislation that he had a hand in creating. To what extent are, uh, is, the, is the Cruz 
Rubio back and forth on immigration notable as we draw closer to balloting in South Carolina? It's notable, but I think the tricky thing for both of them is that it gets a little bit down in the weeds, right? We've seen Cruz defending that amendment to the bill uh, from that same period in 2013, and people have said, you know, you look like you were ready to support some form of quote-unquote amnesty, which is totally anathema in the Republican Party today, but it basically comes down to he was trying to find, it looked like some type of middle ground where these undocumented immigrants who were already in the country could stay. They would never become eligible for full-blown citizenship, but they could get work permits they could drive, et cetera, and that seemed like the middle ground. He says now that was kind of a poison pill amendment that was really just designed to kill the bill overall. That's not exactly what it sounded like at the time, but again, you can, you can hear as I try to explain it to you right now how wonky it sort of mm -hmm. gets. With Rubio, the, the, the problem for him is that it's much simpler to understand. It's much easier to just point at him and say, hey, you were part of the Gang of Eight. Hey, you were part of the Gang of Eight. And exactly. like that instantly resonates for people. So I think that's where Rubio is at a disadvantage with Cruz. He can make the argument against Cruz, and he has, uh, that at one point you were just as for keeping these folks here and allowing them to stay legally as, as I was. Um, but it's a much more complicated, convoluted argument to make. Reporter Callum Borchers of the Washington Post. Things really heating up in a significant way as we closer as we draw closer to the South Carolina uh, uh, primary, which will be a fascinating uh, contest. Uh, thanks for putting it all in context for us today. Callum, we appreciate very much your time. Thanks for having me, Bruce. We'll step aside. We're back with more News Talk right after this.